Well, it's 7 o'clock, so we'll get started with the meeting. We will start with the roll call. Boren? Here. Berg? Here. Serta present? Davis? Excuse. Groth? Here. Hannah? Here. Kittleson? Here. Clayunas? Here. Manny? Excused. Meyer? Here. Montemayor? Excused. Radke? Here. Ryan? Here. Susha? Here. Vanderwilly? Here. Verhassel? Here. Thirteen present. Quorum is present. I will call to order the uh, committee of the whole meeting tonight at 7 o'clock. And with that, I will ask for approval of minutes of the last meetings held June 26th and June 27th. Second. Motion and a second. Is there any amendments? I would just like to point out that um, Alderperson Renee Susha was indeed present, and there was a full 16 present. Thank you. Do we need a motion? Well, I have a motion to amend the minutes to uh, say that Alderman Susha was present. Do I have a second? Second. Motion is second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Moving on, we'll start with communication number 30607 from uh, April 18, 2006, submitting a communication from Asher Heimerman, Chairperson of Resources of Sheboygan Club, requesting that the Common Council look into having a youth council in the city of Sheboygan. Um, Asher had told me that he was not going to be here tonight, so is there uh, any discussion? Alderman Racky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would make a motion we hold this because this is something that I hear from a lot of young people that they'd like to have something like this within the city, um, if not for our purposes, for theirs, or, or maybe both, and it can't hurt to look at, at having such a council with younger people on, you know, in their teens and early 20s, so I think we should hold on to this for until he can be here. Second. I have a motion and a second. Under discussion, Alderman Hanna. Yes, I would just, I'd like to see some involvement on the part of the school district with this. I think this is, I'm Could sorry. You? I would like to see uh, the school district involved on something like this. I think it'd be a, a nice fit for the social studies, uh, political science area to be involved so that there's some, some guidance. Thank you. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this is also a good cause. Um, I'm not sure how old this young gentleman is, and I'm, I don't think he's old enough to drive or come to a future meeting, being that they're held at 7 o'clock at night. I don't know if we need to hold this document. I think we should pursue this idea and put something together, but I don't see a need to hold on to these documents. I would suggest that we make a motion to file this. I have a motion to file in a second, which would take precedence over the motion to hold. Uh, under discussion, President Berg. Um, this is not uh, on, under discussion on the filing, but it is on the document. Uh, so if I could proceed, I think Alderman Hanna raised a point, and uh, uh, I would, I don't want to confound things with, with multiple motions, but it would appear that if we could uh, send Mr. Uh, uh, Heimerman's communication to the appropriate school board committee, I think that would be a good parallel referral and through that system perhaps they might be able to set up a mechanism where we could cooperate uh, to, uh, to assist them in, I guess, uh, understanding municipal government. And uh, uh, for that uh, purpose, I would make a, I guess, a parallel motion to refer a copy of this document to the school district committee that can deal with it. All right, I have a motion and a second to... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a motion to file which takes precedence over all motions. Correct or not? <laughs> Struggling in this one. Motion to refer, I believe, will take precedent. Uh, but referral is not to one of our committees. All right. So. Well, my, my feeling is that uh, communications coming from citizens, we look at them in the, in, the, uh, in the committees, and we had one from in PPNS from a, a boy who was probably 10 or 12, and we treated it like it was, it was a communication from an adult. It was about parks and, uh, and his concerns with that, and we have another one going in 
from a, a child too. So I feel with the communications that way, they can be involved in local government that way if we treat them like adults and that the concerns are valid. But if this committee would prefer to send it to, to the school board, that's up to the committee. <laughs> I guess my question is, does the, for anybody who knows, <laughs> does the uh, motion refer to the committee or to the school board take precedence over the motion to file? Alderman Racky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I think what would happen here is we can do a duel here. We can refer this to the school board, but file it on our end, and we'll disclose the matter here. And that's what we're, we're going for, and that's, I think prop, you know, totally proper. All right, thank you, Alderman Groff. I was going to suggest that you you vote on the the motion to file and then vote separately on the motion to refer to the school board. Uh, treat it as two separate motions, and I think the outcome will be what we're looking for. All right, thank you. With that, all in favor of filing the motion of of filing the document signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? So it's filed. Thank you. M moving on. So we, okay. All in favor of uh, referring the document to the school board, signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. All right. So we referred it to the school board. Okay. Moving on. Communication number 0607 from Debbie Desmolin stating her concerns with the issues of dog owners and offering a proposal to allow leash dogs at Maywood. Dave Beeble, if you could uh, start, start us off with the uh, conversation about Maywood, allowing dogs in Maywood and Evergreen Park. Yeah, if you could uh, approach the podium. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Real quickly, the, the issue of, of dogs in parks has been an issue that we as a department as well as uh, the Parks and Forestry Commission and this Common Council have been discussing for some time. Uh, the issue of having allowed leash dogs in Maywood was also an item that was discussed at the Parks and Forestry Commission as well as the Public Works Committee um, as well as currently Evergreen Park as well as was a proposal and that currently is being under, under study right now in the Parks and Forestry Commission. Um, it's being held in the committee, and we're looking at um, bringing in some of the other key stakeholders that use the park system. Uh, regarding the issue of Maywood in allowing leash dogs, the Department of Public Works, we talked about this, and uh, we do not favor this proposal. Uh, talking with Dave Cook, and I believe you may have uh, received an email. If not, I, I can just share it with you. Basically, I'll summarize it real quick. Is that Maywood has always had a preservation and education as its high priority as the use of that property. Um, it's one of close proximity to residents within the city. It's 120 acres of, of uh, biodiversity. Uh, Dave Cook, the director of Maywood, is a dog owner himself, and he personally feels that it would be inappropriate to bring dogs to Maywood. Simply for, there's many school groups with children, the, the, the nature of the park. Um, he, feels, he feels that this could, I guess, disrupt the, the balance of what they're trying to preserve and educate, provide that setting for educational setting for, for natural reasons. So in that, in that quick summary, I guess, from a department perspective, we're not in favor of this proposal. Um, it's not to say that we're, we're opposed to dogs in any of the park system. In fact, we're going through uh, a restudy of a master plan of our entire park system. And I think there's a great opportunity when we, when we redo our master, master plan for our park system. I'm sure the issue of a dog park, uh, dog areas within parks, will be, will be an issue that will be discussed and researched in detail. Um, so I guess... With that, I'll, I'll answer any questions if anyone may have. Or... Alderman Susha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, I'm glad that we have a Park and Forestry Commission and also a Public Works uh, Committee that are looking into the dog issues. And I think that once you do all the research and you're ready to make a recommendation, I would like to see it brought back to Committee of the Whole because uh, I've received a lot of calls in regards to the Southside dog run and I wasn't on any committee and I didn't have a whole lot of background information to answer these questions. But I'm, I'm trusting that you're doing the research and um, I would ask that in the future that you bring a proposal back um, just to give us some insights so we can ask questions at that time rather than just focusing on Maywood tonight. And with that said, I'd make a motion to file this document. I have a motion, a second to follow the document. Under discussion, Alderman Hanna? Yes, I concur with uh, Alderperson Sushi that I look forward to uh, your group uh, getting a diverse group of opinions and bringing those conclusions back to us. I, too, am getting quite a few phone calls, more related to the possibility of utilizing Evergreen uh, with a leased dog uh, situation. And I'd like to get some good balanced feedback on that, so thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hannah. Alderman Meyer? I just have a question for Mr. Beeble, so I'll just wait till we well, do the vote. If you'd like to ask him now. Well, I would just like Mr. Beeble to just name the areas in the city that people at present can take their dogs, because we do have a couple dog runs in the area. Yes, well, we do have the, the, the off-leash dog run, which is located on the beach area east of Lakeview Park access it through the parking lot area and then access to the beach. That's the dog run off-leashed area. There's another off-leashed area that is on the north side, which is uh, along the Pigeon River corridor east of, <clears throat> excuse me, east of the, the wayside, the LS wayside. And the dog owners are allowed to go walk their dogs on leash there as well. We have another dog walk area that is leashed, which is at our Green Wing Ponds off of Washington Avenue on the south side as well as any sidewalk and any of our bike path areas and our recreational trail areas unleashed are, are clearly acceptable for dogs. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Verhassel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dave, I know that you work closely with the Park Commission. Could you, as you look at this plan over the next six or 12 months, and specifically at Evergreen, opening it up to dogs, could you also help us understand at that time if there are any challenges with opening Evergreen as it relates to Maywood, because I know the two parks are adjoining, correct, in some areas? Yes, there's, there's a trail system along the Pigeon River that connects the two parks together. Okay. Just so that we better understand that at that time, if we do decide to open up Evergreen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dave, something that I talked to you about a couple of weeks ago, I had a call from another elderly constituent who has some trouble walking about the, uh, about the uh, dog run on the south side with possibly putting a railing there or something. Have you had a chance to research that any further? We're, we're looking into that. We're trying to get some uh, pricing put together and some costs. And uh, we, if it's feasible uh, cost-wise, we might be able to do it this year. But we're just getting some of that material put together. And we'll probably uh, bring that to either the Public Works Committee or as well as Park and Forestry to give them a, an idea of what we're looking at there. But yes. Uh, Thank you. Uh, President. Berg? Oh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, as, as a note, I think this has been uh, kind of a dogged problem we've been chasing around for quite a period of time. Uh, and I guess I would just like to um, ask if this will be a, a significant priority where we can expect uh, some level of decision, understanding you're going to have a long-range park plan. Uh, but I think the interest in the community continues to, to be there. I would say that in the past, uh, uh, looking at the direction the council has provided, I think uh, we've uh, asked that the Parks Commission look at it. At that time, the, there was an unfavorable reaction to opening, if you would, uh, any of the parks to, uh, to pets. And I think that then created uh, somewhat of a backlash and a renewed interest on the part of, of many of the pet owners uh, in our area. And I guess the only, uh, a couple of questions. Would you find it, uh, would, would it be helpful if the council provided you some direction in terms of our wishes regarding uh, having limited access for pets in parks? Because I think then we can not determine park by park. Uh, should this park be uh, a dog park, or should we have access uh, to, to pets? 
uh, but a general direction to the uh, Parks and Forestry the Commission, which affirms that we believe as a council that uh, pets uh, should be allowed under certain conditions. Uh, and I think then we can, we can fight that out on the council floor. We can, if you would, uh, look at that as being a direction we want to follow, and then that hopefully could give the Park and Forestry Commission some guidance. Any comments on that? Uh, clearly, that, that's the council's prerogative. If they, if they so choose the desire to, to, to send a directive to, to the commission to study, by all means, we would, we would do so. I guess part of the process of doing the master plan is that we're, we're going to survey the key stakeholders of the park system, and that can be you know, recreational groups, sports groups, families, the dog owners, for instance, mm -hmm. and, and try to identify all their needs and, and concerns with the park system and, and try to come up with some solutions to, their, to those problems. Um, but clearly, if, they, if this, this council so desires to have such a, such a directive, um, by all means, that, that would uh, be, be looked at very seriously by the, by the study. Thank you. Alderman Racky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a suggestion, it's not, a, it's not an immediate solution, but I believe it's January until March 31st or April 30th, something like that, is the period for registering dogs. What would be wrong with having a little survey downstairs in the finance department when people come in to register their dogs asking people just to fill out a little card just so we have a little information which parks people would really like us to look at and work with it from that, from that standpoint and that would give us a lot more information than us sitting here trying to second guess where the dog owners really want to go. I wouldn't have any problem with taking the extra minute to just fill out such a survey and I'm sure a lot of other dog owners wouldn't have, that, wouldn't have a problem with it either. Thank you. Yeah, and anything like that would uh, would help give us direction from the from the citizens. Is there any other questions for Dave Beeble? Thank you. Uh, Debbie, uh, would you like to take the podium and and uh, and add to your communication? Um, I, I still don't understand why leash dogs would be denied any access anywhere because they can't disturb the children if they're on leash and they can't disrupt the, the ecosystem in Maywood any more than, you know, bikers, fishermen, um, what else do we have? There were hunters there one evening. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, there are so many people using the park. I don't, I've, I see dog owners denied access almost anywhere, and I myself get burned easily, so all those supposedly free access for dogs, I, you know, I can't go unless it's late at night and it's, they're further away from my home. If all dog owners were allowed leashed dogs in all parks and they pick up after themselves, I don't see the problem if their dog, I mean, if their dog isn't, you know, trained or is aggressive even on the leash, that would be case by case. Um, I also heard just recently this guy who works in the city, um, a lady came to Sheboygan for vacation and um, she was uh, really upset when she found out she couldn't bring her dog anywhere. She had to keep him in the hotel and she had traveled 10 hours to, to vacation in Sheboygan, so she decided Sheboygan will no longer be a vacation spot for her. She was just furious, and she wanted to call the city and ask him why, and this guy talked to her, tried to calm her down. He says, that's just the rules here, and she says the most ridiculous rules. That beach on the south, which every, it's south side that everyone fought for, the park view, I mean, the, you know, they got permission for is so inferior to the place we had before next to the Blue Harbor. It's kind of like segregation and there's really not a whole lot of place for a dog walker to walk, I mean someone who, who wants to walk with their dog and not just sit there and watch their dog run. There's not a whole lot of place there. And so I just feel like if we study park by park we'll get the worst parks because it's just kind of a place to throw dog owners at so no one sees them and because I mean dogs socialize just by being around people but if they're always segregated I ran into a guy 
just recently who has a dog, and he says, this area is bad because I can't take my dog anywhere. So my dog stays in the house and doesn't get any exercise, and I get to take my kids to the parks because that's where they want to go, and then I have to do a separate walk for my dog. And he goes, when you work, you can't do children once and then dog once. You just can't add everything together. So I, I think we're, we keep on trying to deny access to dog owners, and if we keep them on the leash, they're no more of a threat than bike riders, um, anyone else who wants to use the park. I also took a walk through Maywood, and there is trash <laughs> in a lot of places. So it's, you know, not everyone's respecting the ecosystem. You know, there's plastic cups and papers and all this stuff. So, and we end up picking it up a lot. But it's not, you know, it's not like dogs are going to add as much as some human ad, humans add. So I really wish we would work with this and not keep denying accent, access, like I said in my uh, communication that I emailed to everyone, Beloit, all their parks are open to leashed dogs. So I, I'd really like this to be considered and, and not make us all outlaws if we want to walk our dog anywhere besides along pesticide lawns. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If anybody else would like to speak, I'm going to ask for a three-minute limit. And uh, but first, I'm going to get Alderman Ryan. Just one second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I do agree uh, somewhat that, that we should have multiple parks for dogs. With Sheboygan uh, becoming more of a tourist destination and more of a, uh, more of a, a metropolitan community with uh, multiple uh, um, uh, condominium projects going up in the downtown area, etc. Uh, I think there should be uh, multiple dog parks, not saying uh, that I would agree that every, dog, every area of every park should be open to dogs, uh, but if we are going to attract uh, more young professionals to this area that may be uh, condominium uh, uh, dwellers uh, and uh, empty nesters, etc., to, uh, to come to this area. I think we need multiple locations that can be walked to uh, rather than uh, putting your dog in a car and driving uh, you know, five or 10 miles to go to a dog park. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We do have two subcommittees looking at this information right now, the Park and Forestry Commission and Public Works. I think it's a little premature to try to have a full-blown discussion on this topic right now when there's too many issues that we need answers to. I think the more appropriate venue to provide feedback right now would be Park and Forestry and the Public Works. They are doing the research right now. We're not as a committee of the whole. So I would mm -hmm. ask that everyone who has suggestions and feedback direct them to the committees that are doing the research. And once the research is gathered and a recommendation can be made, it should come back to this committee um, so we have a chance to get educated and ask the questions and make the final decisions. And with that said, I'd like to call the question. All right. When the question is called, uh, for those of you who don't know, then uh, there's no other discussion and we have to vote on it. So uh, to the citizens that would like to speak on this, Alderman Susha, um, like Alderman Susha suggested, we have two other committees looking at it. So we can, you can either go to the committee meetings or we can direct your communications towards those committees. So all in favor of filing the uh, communication signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. I've been asked to pull uh, for item number seven, RC number 570607, by Elder Person Graf and Meyer establishing the monthly premium equivalent rate for the medical benefit plan effective for January 2007 coverage. Alderman Graf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I make a motion that the RC be accepted and adopted and that we, um, we recommend establishing the monthly premium equivalent rate for, medical benefit, for the medical benef benefit plan effective January of 2007. Second. I have a motion and a second. Under discussion, Mayor Perez, did, did you want to address this? Yes, thank you, Mr. Good evening, everyone. We have uh, Mr. Gephardt and I, Richard, uh, have a, a synopsis, if you may, of the, our health benefit plan. And we wanted to give you 
somewhat of a cursory review or introductory review of the history of this health benefit plan and some of the activity that has been occurring over the last two years. We, we hope to do this in order to give you an idea of what we're faced with when we talk about health care in, in the city of Sheboygan. I believe, Richard, did you give everyone a copy of this? If, if you will refer to your health benefit plan here, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the history and the recent health plan history, uh, a little bit about the expenditures and the revenues by groups in 205. Rich will come in and talk to you about the stop loss insurance, the expenditures for prescriptions in 205, and he will continue with the expenditures for medical services in 205 and the 207 rate calculation. Then I'll just sum it up uh, with the projected trend, which is a very brief, brief summary, and then I'd like to show you some visuals that uh, will live an image, leave an image in your mind uh, as to where we are in terms of history and in terms of cost and in terms of participation between the city of Sheboygan and the employees. This is not intended, again, to be a full-blown discussion or debate on the, on the health uh, benefit plan or health care issue. What is intended to you, intended to do is to give you an idea of what's going on so that you can start thinking about it because this is an issue that's going to come before us. It's going to cause some serious debate uh, because it's, 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 an, it's a plan that has, as you know, um, have our city employees pay two and a half percent that are represented and the non-representative are paying uh, five percent. So it's a, it's a matter that's going to cause uh, some debate. And again, we'll go down uh, by, by bullet point and then I'll come back with the visuals. The health benefit plan, uh, as you'll see there, began in the 1st of January in 1998 as a self-insurance internal service for the city of Sheboygan, uh, all the departments and the retirees that use the uh, third-party claims. There are currently 175 single plan participants and 437 family plans. This is about 1,200 uh, covered. Now, mind you, we only have 479 employees right now, so you would ask, why in the world are we covering for 1,200? Well, that's because of the retired uh, employees that uh, are still benefiting from the plan. And that coverage covers them, their dependents, and, and spouses, and so forth, uh, percentage-wise. The annual rate calculation for the health benefit plan is based on a formula that was derived from the insurance division of the, the Virchow, Kraus, and the city's previous auditors from discussions with the prior states, a third-party administrator for the health benefit plan. And this formula is similar to what the insurance companies use now and before to develop monthly premium plans for all the employees. If you look at the recent health plan history here, between 02 and 05, the medical claims increased from 3.4 million to 5, point, to 5 million, and the prescription claims increased from 1 million to 1.3. So you can see that in a period of three years, there's a significant increase. And you can almost expect, and we'll talk about that briefly also, you can almost expect a constant increase in this health care cost. The total expenditures increase, as you will note, from 4.8 million in 02 to 6.8 million in 05. So there again, a three point a three year span from 4.8 to 6.8, two two million dollar increase. And this is a general trend that has been occurring. The total revenues increase from 5.1 million in 02 to 7.3 million in 05. The fund balance was in a deficit, and you'll notice that, that the fund balance was in a deficit at the beginning of 02 and has increased to a positive in one, one point, a positive 1.3 million balance at the end of 05. Now, it is anticipated that the stop loss premiums, and Richard will talk about this, uh, that they will continue to increase and that the city will have to take on more of the risk by increasing that stop loss level in order to maintain the stable premiums throughout our city and throughout every department. As the city has, has uh, more risk exposure, it will be important to maintain a fund balance in a health benefit plan that can absorb potential increases in large claims. The obvious question there is, where is the money going to come from? 
expenditures and revenues by groups in 05. In 05, the total expenditures for the active employees were 5,465,986. And the active employees paid contributions of 203, 203,992. And I'll be showing you some visuals in a minute. The total expenditures for the retirees were 1,289,023. The retirees made payments of 1,036,534. And the city paid 188,382 in accordance with the union agreements. The total expenditures for the previous employees that are on COBRA were 60,623. And payments by the participants were 27, 366. So you can see a little a variance there where the city is paying more than the employees are paying. And that's been a very common trend. And one of the issues that you'll be confronted with is, are we going to change that? How are we going to work cooperatively with our employees so that they can participate in a more uh, active role in paying a little bit more for their, for their uh, health care costs? Now, as I said, the stop loss and the expenditures for prescriptions in 05 and going down the line, uh, Mr. Gephardt will address, and then I'll come back and talk to you, uh, show you some of the visuals. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. The city purchased commercial insurance that covers claims for each individual above 125000 per year which is termed stop-loss insurance. The policy also has aggregate claim coverage if the total claims of the plan were to exceed an attachment point, which is $8.7 million for 2006. The stop-loss coverage premiums increased from 238000 in 2002 to 336000 in 2005. The stop-loss level had been for claims above $100,000 during those years. An added note that in 2005, the stop-loss carrier paid over a half million dollars for five individuals whose claims collectively totaled over one million dollars. So you can see where our, some of our concern is about where the future of the, the premiums will be going. The estimated premium for 2006 is 406,000 for a stop-loss level of 125,000. And the expenditures for prescriptions in 2005, the city paid 20,000 prescription claims for a total cost of 1,389,000, which was an increase of 6% over 2004. 50% of the 05 claims were for generic prescriptions at an average cost of $16 per generic claim. And 50% were brand claims at an average cost of $118. The brand claims when when generic was available, totaled 483, or 2.4% of the total claims, with an average cost of $64. And that's, of course, where we like to concentrate on, but our consultants are saying that we're, we're doing fairly well there already. Uh, and the expenditures for medical services in 05, the claims for medical services at hospital facilities, including surgery, totaled three million four hundred and thirty one thousand and this was an increase of one hundred and thirty four thousand or four percent the claims for physician office visits x-rays and lab totaled one million four hundred and twenty six thousand which was an increase of two hundred and forty six thousand or twenty one percent the claims for other medical services such as drugs prescribed for patients in the hospitals totaled total five hundred and eleven thousand and this was an increase of one hundred and ninety nine thousand or sixty four percent as you can see, that's a significant increase. And apparently one of the factors in that is there are new specially injectable drugs uh, that are given at the medical uh, facilities. And these new drugs can cost thousands of dollars per month. And we think that is part of the reason that we're seeing that increase in that area and will probably be a trend in, in the future and one of the concerns on keeping our, our plan stable. Uh, we have been addressing that. Uh, we had Ed Zurich and, and I had a meeting with our third-party administrators, both Prairie States and Restat, uh, last week uh, to look at a different uh, team between the, them to try to address those areas and to get better pricing on, on those uh, high-cost drugs. 
The total claims for medical services in 05 were 5,369,000, increase of 580,000, or 11%. The 2007 rate calculation, um, the portion of the rate calculation for the medical claims uses the attachment point from the aggregate coverage along with a trend factor that is obtained from a third party administrator per each states. The trend factor is currently 6.8% and is based on the experience of the local search organization. The medical claims for 2007 are projected to be 5,918,000 compared to an estimate of 5,489,000 for 06. The estimated cost in 07 for the prescription drug claims, stop loss premiums, and third party administration fees is projected to be 2,288,000 compared to 1,996,000 for 06. The calculation for 07 would require a month monthly rate for employees and retirees not on Medicare of $570 for a single plan and $1,425 for a family plan in 07. This is an increase of $54 for a single plan and $135 for a family plan on an increase of 10.5%. The monthly rate for retirees on Medicare would be $403 for a single plan and $807 for a family plan. This is an increase of $40 for a single plan and $81 for a family plan or an increase of 11.3%. The total expenditures for the health benefit plan for 07 are currently estimated to be $8.2 million, which is an increase of 729,000 over the 06 estimate. I'll now turn the presentation back to the mayor. Thank you, Rich. If you look at the projected trend for the health, health uh, benefit plan, it, it, it's a very interesting projection here, but it's a very reasonable deduction to make based on the history and activity that we are experiencing now. And that is that based on the past tr trend from 02 to 07, with total expenditures increasing from 4.8 million to an estimated 8.2 million, the trend for the next five years would be projected and increasing approximately one million per year on the average of 13 million for 2012 and that would reflect an 11 percent increase per year now these numbers are staggering and they're staggering because that's one of the big issues that's going to face you and me and rich gapart and every and mr surik all of us together and we're going to have to find a common ground and a workable solution uh, amongst ourselves and uh, our employees what I want to do now is just show you some visuals, and if you have some questions with the visuals, I can try to explain a lot of that, and Mr. Gephardt can do too. But the TV's not on, is it? Yeah. What is on? Yeah, we're on TV. It is on right now? Yeah. Okay. I hope everyone can see here. I'll step on the side here. Can everyone see more or less? Maybe too low. Okay, how's that? Everybody see now? Now you can't. How are we going to do this? Now you can't. Okay. We do have copies. You do have copies? Okay. Okay. Okay, this chart reflects the charges to departments for health benefit plan from 1997 to 06. Now what's critical here for you to... to uh, to uh, understand is is how it has increased and then it actually took a little drop in 1999 but from that point on you can see this thing just skyrocketing all the way up even in 05 to five million almost six million dollars and then it's still rising a little bit now, rich and i joke a little bit because we say the next time we show it to you it'll be out of this chart I think it's what we talk about, Rich. But this, again, will give you an idea of the activity in the last few years from 97 to 06 as to what has happened. And again, point out that there was a drop, but then from that point on, it kept going up and it continues to go up. And based on the trend that we can expect, it's not going anywhere but up. Your next chart, and obviously these are not in the same order that you have them, so try to find them in there. 
Monthly charges for health benefit plans for employees with family plans. Here again is a, a graphic a view of how in, in 2002 to 06 and projected for next year, how it just continues to go up from 560,000 to one and a, almost one and a half million dollars. Now, folks, this is a very significant increase in, in during this short period of time, and it's also significant because it illustrates pretty clear and convincing of what we can expect in the next few years. And this is not going to change; it's going to go con continue to go up. And health care costs, obviously, is a, is a great benefit to our employees, and, and by all means, they deserve that. The struggle for you and the challenge for you is going to be how can we afford to pay it and how can we balance the, the need to provide this valuable service and benefit to our, to our employees uh, and being able to afford it. This is duplicate? Okay, the lighter color. I think Rich is playing games with me here. Got to keep it fun. Now here... The health benefit plan charges to departments, and this is this is an important one if you will take a look at this because you will see, for example, police having a little over one and uh, one point six million one million six hundred thousand dollars in charges, and then you've got public works and fire. Now you would ask, or most people would ask, why are they why are the, are the costs associated more high there than anywhere else? They're bigger departments. The, the police is the bigger department than public works than fire. So that, that's reflected in, in the numbers. And then you can see where, where finance, uh, city buildings, general government. And if you'll recall, when I did my budget sessions, my presentations on the budget, these were the same categories that, that, that we talked about then. And these are the charges that are being made to each of these respective departments uh, on, on health care costs. The next chart is what Rich was talking about is, well, we're paying a lot of money, but where exactly is it being paid? In what areas is it re really being paid? And this will give you an idea on the health benefit plan fund expenditures for 03 and 05. It will give you an idea of where it's going. For example, here, if you look at uh, the blue would be 03, the, uh, the other color would be 04, and then the other color would be 05. You can see an increase in every, every, uh, every year. But in surgery, for example, in, in 05, we're looking at about $1,225,000 1, more or less. And you can see an increase going. Uh, outpatient facility, you can see an increase there. Uh, and then we've got some of the claims that are going inpatient, prescriptions. And you've got x-rays, mental, nervous. And then you've got other medical service and the claims administration. So these, these are the areas where this money is being paid to, and, and this illustrates, again, the increase that continues to, to, uh, to grow, to, uh, to occur. And finally, I think this is probably the one you need to look at because this will demonstrate what, what we're talking about in terms of a challenge and in terms of a need for our employees and the Common Council to, to work cooperatively to find a good solution. You will see this one here. The black represents the city's portion of health benefits cost. And you can see that in 02 and then in 03 it keeps going up. In 05 it just popped up all the way. But here you will see in white, right, right at the bottom, what the employee portion is. There's a huge difference. Now that difference is reflected again in what you, uh, represented employees paying two two and a half percent and non-reps paying five percent. So again, this this is what we're we're faced with. When you look at 05 here, you're looking at what, what we were talking earlier about the six million dollar range, which is a city's portion that we have to cover for healthcare costs and then the employee portion being way down there that they're responsible for covering. And that's where the struggle is going to be, to try to balance what the city has to pay, what the employee has to pay, and still maintain a fair and equitable distribution of that cost where we can continue to provide a benefit for our employees and their families. That's going to be the struggle. And it's not going to be an easy one, and we've got our job cut out for us. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Alderman Hanna? Yes, Mr. Mayor. When we look at other cities of comparable size in the country, I've seen data uh, that indicates that employee contributions are closer to 8 to 10 percent. Rich, when we looked at that Kaiser study, what was the set of fair 
assumption. About eight when, to ten. when you're looking across cities within Wisconsin, what sort of trends are you seeing in participation? That one I would defer to Ed. What are we seeing? Well, <clears throat> Come here. We'll take turns. Thank you, Mayor. I would say, yeah, we are behind, right? As Mayor mentioned, a two and a half for represented employees and five for non rep. Um, and that's one of the issues we're going to address very strongly in negotiations. But there, there's two sides of the story, too. I mean, a lot of cities and municipalities have also purchased, you know, by giving more in wages, uh, to get more in contributions. But we are still, and be that as it may be, we still need to work very hard on and increasing employees' contribution. And we are, um, should I continue? You want okay, a number of things we're working on, I'll, I'll give you a short snap. I think at the end of the day, uh, we'll probably need a statewide insurance plan. All the persons, um, Kittleson and Mount Mayor and I went to Madison a few weeks ago. And eventually, what's gonna have to happen is we're gonna have to have a plan that's quite similar to Workman's Comp, where every every employer contributes. Right now, it's a a smaller portion of employers and employees contributing to the plan, which increase our costs. We're paying insurance for people that are not insured, and that's one of the main problems. But that's not gonna happen tomorrow. Uh, specifically, we are looking at, um, I was just down in Racine with a representative from the county and myself, and we looked at uh, a joint venture with the county and the city of Racine to have a walk-in clinic where uh, municipal employees would be uh, offered probably a lesser service. They won't be seeing a doctor. They'd be seeing a nurse practitioner, but about half the cost of a visit that you normally we experience here right now. So we're working on that. Um, in fact, uh, we have a meeting coming up already part of next month with the unions, and we'll be talking about putting in HSAs, contributions, and other items that can help reduce the cost. And again, we're going to stress we're going to stress very strongly in negotiations that the employees have to contribute more to the insurance. It, it's a given. But it's not the total answer to the problem. It's a very complicated issue. And uh, that's about all. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And again, it's not going to be, it's, there's not going to be an easy solution, as Ed said. But I think you asked about comp comparisons here, Alderman Hanna. I was uh, informed today that the, uh, the average and, and the private sector uh, of employee contribution to health care uh, programs is about 23 to 24 percent. That's what the, the public sector is, I mean the private sector is playing, paying and obviously we're, we're way below that even ourselves. So we, we do have a, a challenge before us and there are, the only answer is how are we going to balance that challenge, uh, that, those needs uh, with our employees? Uh, just have a, a question then I'll get uh, Alderman Bourne. It looks like in 2004 Employees are paying more than 2005. Is that correct? It, yes. And, and, and why? Ed's going to explain that one for us, too. He's got the history of that one. I wasn't uh, in a position to know then. Uh, what happened was that uh, we, had, we had a pretty strong discussion with the union, and, and they, they, uh, they agreed, um, almost all the unions, particularly the larger unions, agreed that they would take whatever increase they got for half the year and put it back into insurance premiums. And that was an effort to keep the cost down. And there was a one-time deal. Uh, I don't think they'll do it again, but so. The one thing we have to be careful with also is that it's very common for negotiations to go uh, in the direction of, we'll pay you 3% more on health care costs, but give us that difference in salary. That doesn't really help as much because at the end of the day, the impact on the budget, on the budget is still the same or pretty, pretty near to it. So it doesn't really help us. I think that, as Ed said, the only solution here is going to be how are we going to ask our employees to contribute more, a little more of a fair share. I got a bunch of lights up Lights here. are going up, huh? All of them born. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for Mr. Sirk. Mr. Sirk. Yes, sir. Mr. Surik, you mentioned that community that was uh, thinking about having a walk-in clinic together. Are there any uh, cities and counties that have combined in Wisconsin to have their medical insurance as, as one group rather than, you know, just the city and the county? Uh, is it, can that legally be done, and would it be practical, uh, or are, are there any communities doing that? Um, 
I don't know specifically on the medical plan. I know, like for ourselves, we have combined with uh, the city, the uh, the county, and the schools, and ourselves on a, on the uh, prescription drug plan with Restat. So we saved a few dollars there. Uh, one of the problems we have, particularly in the city of Sheboygan, is that uh, our uh, PPO is with uh, PHN St. Nick's. Uh, the county currently is with uh, uh, Memorial, and so are the so uh, so are the schools. Uh, there is a plan down the line. We're looking at next fall where they may open up both of them. In fact, the, the uh, school board just went through a plan with uh, uh, it does offer discounts for both from, from both groups. The county's looking at it, and we'll be looking at it too. Um, it'll save a few dollars, but it's, it doesn't, doesn't, I mean, the costs are there. I mean, you can't, it's like you're buying a product. Um, unless you cheapen the product, or the person providing the product gives you a bigger discount, you're not going to really solve the problem. And it, you know, we're not. This is not a Wisconsin issue; it's a national issue. And again, I think I mentioned earlier about the. I, we had talked at one time with with Gene to offer uh, the county's offered a resolution in to back the newbie plan, making the statewide plan. But again, that's probably years away. But something we might want to do. We should talk about anyway. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sturick. You might want to stay up here. <laughs> Alderman Ryan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Mr. Sturick, um, now Prairie states that that is simply the third party administrator for the funding, for the city's funding of the plan, I take it? Prairie states is a plan administrator. Um, and in effect, we're kind of a do-it-yourself program uh, in that we don't have an agent or really that handles the case. When the bills come in, they are submitted to Prairie States, and they have a program and software that processes the bills, takes the discounts, uh, then we provide them dollars to pay those bills. Okay. And so they, they're basically uh, just a processing of claims. So they're, yeah. they're, they're basically paying all the claims. Yeah, they're, 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 they're processing. At one time, I did, some years ago, we had, uh, we had a larger company. We had looked at perhaps doing it ourselves, Unless you employ an area around 10,000 employees, it's not worth it. Right, right. You know? um, now, two and, uh, the, the reps at 2.5%, the non-reps at 5%, is there a deductible uh, on these plans, or is that simply their only out-of-pocket costs if they, if they rack up uh, $50,000 of health insurance costs a year, or is that just 2.5% of the premium and they, they never pay anything on top of that? Well, there is a, they pay a, doc, a DOV doctor office visit of $12. So every time they go in, they're, they'll pay the $12. And on prescriptions, do they contribute to the there's, there's a deductible for it's 8 and 20, 8 and 25, I think it is, for generic and uh, 20 for uh, branded. And the same for mail order if you go for a 90-day prescription. Is there any limit on their, uh, if, if you have somebody that has half a dozen children and every time they get a sniffle they take them in, is there, are there any limits on coverage as far as the city's policy of your covered for uh, six visits per child per year? Or can they take them in on a weekly basis because they have a headache? No, that's why they, it's, it's, a, it's a $12 copay every time they go in. But again, we looked at that, and that's one reason we like to look at a, a walk in clinic so that um, it would really reduce the cost on that. So, so on the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not an insurance expert, don't get me wrong, but I'm just judging okay. from what I've dealt with insurance in my own company. Um, Everything has to be negotiated with the unions, obviously. If, you, if the city is to change anything on their, their health insurance as far as their contribution or the plan in general? Yeah, all plan design is negotiable. Any change would have to be agreed by both parties. So everything right now is agreed by both parties, and any changes anywhere have to be agreed on by both parties. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. President Berg? Uh, yes, uh, following up on Alderman Ryan's uh, questions, the premium co-pays are negotiated individually with each individual bargaining group. However, the total plan is not negotiated. You have representatives from each of the major bargaining groups, and then you look at the structure of the plan. Is that my understanding? That's correct. And, and that will be coming up. And so the, the issue, if you would, of deductibles uh, could be something that could be looked at for 
uh, individuals assuming more individual risk, if you would, uh, as part of the plan, and then we could do a cost comparison of that. That's correct. And that would require then that group or that committee to, uh, and would that be by majority, or how does that process work? Well, we, we can tell pretty well uh, which group is costing more, and, and actually it's, it's pretty much across the board. I mean, there isn't one group that stands out over another. Um, we do see, see more stress in, in protective services uh, than we do in the other, other groups for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, generally, the plan, I mean, as long as, even prior to my being here, the plan was pretty well across the board for, for all participants, all employees. And um, in fact, we were finally got, at one point, our contracts are up at different times, so it was difficult to negotiate across the board changes in the plan when you're dealing with a splintered party. So we're able to get, get all the unions on, on one key. So in fact, uh, we, did, we did make some changes, uh, a major change a few years ago, and that was agreed to by all parties. So, uh, um, and for unfortunate part is if, if, if you have one union that wants uh, the whole pet, um, and they decide to go to arbitration and, and they prevail, uh, we, might, we have lost. I mean, so it, it's best to look at the whole picture before you try and split one group off. Thank you, Vice President Serta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this information is helpful in terms of giving a, um, a cost analysis, um, a fair cost analysis, and the trends that we'll um, foresee in the future. There was suggestions made tonight, and I was wondering if there's any way that we could rate those suggestions in terms of what's feasible um, immediately, what would be our ideal wish list, um, because it was reiterated how we as older persons could help um, and I think if we could stay on top of that, I don't know if it would be appropriate to um, conduct that information within salary and grievance and then have a report, full report given back to the Committee of the Whole, if that would be helpful. Anything, I guess, in aside, um, I, negotiations is one thing, and you had said um, we are somewhat restricted because they are negotiable, but any other suggestions that we could um, you know, pursue? <laughs> Something tangible, a timeline. To answer your question, we are, uh, we are in the process of setting up a meeting. We have an insurance committee, which is composed of several aldermen and the union presidents, uh, which will be open to all aldermen. And, we're in, and in that meeting, we're having uh, Jay Scott, who, with, uh, with, us, with uh, uh, Jabez, an insurance consultant, will come in. And, and I've gone through the process two or three times trying to figure out what HSA is, HRA, and all these other you know, um, programs that reportedly can save you money. Um, but he will explain them to them, and then, and then we're got to prioritize. I mean, I think one of the issues I think we're talking about is right out of the box would be higher deductibles and, co and a, a copay and premium share. I mean, we've talked about that, and it's been a very hot discussion and negotiations for as long as I've been here. And it's been a very difficult struggle to, get, to come along without providing a, a larger wage increase. And it's the kind of the two go hand in hand, so. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Clahunas. Thank you. Um, Ed, is, did, you, did you say either deductibles at all? It's a $12 doctor office the, visit. That's the only that's thing, it, but right. there's no like 500? No, we do not have that, no. First 500 is, is an employee's responsibility? No. no. Nothing like that, okay. I uh, encourage you, the creative ways you're looking at things I think is great. Uh, healthcare is a national issue. I, you know, that we can somehow solve it here, but we can at least creatively look at ways in which we can be uh, looking forward, uh, looking at the city's obligations to its employees and having the employees understand their obligations to the city to get this coverage that they have, this good coverage. I think it is good. Is it good at health insurance? I mean, um, do you find that the quality of it and the care, I mean, the coverage is, I don't see the plan in front of me, but, you know, in terms of what it covers. Well, or, yeah, our plan design is very good. Yeah. I mean, it, so and, they, get uh, good, they get a good benefit. Good, good service. Yeah, it's it's um, uh, it provides very good coverage. What more can I say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Alderman Graf. Thank you, um, Mr. Sir. In two thousand and four, when when um, some of the bargaining groups uh, participated in in their raise was what they gave in, um, as a contribution. Did all the, the bargaining groups participate in that? No, they did not. Okay. Oh. And what the bargaining groups that did participate, what percentage were they paying at that time? Do you know? It was still at the two and a half percent. But then they contributed an additional, didn't they? 
Well, yeah, what they did, they took the raise, which was like 1.75, if I recall, or two and a half, and it said, okay, we're going to forego the raise. That money was put into a POP premium, premium only plan, and that money went into, they took an additional uh, premium share for that period of time. But not all, all the bargaining groups participated in the That is correct. Just, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I would like to uh, thank all the retirees for uh, paying their fair share. I'd say very good share. I mean, last year, it looks like their expenditures were $1.2 million, and they made payments of just over a $1 million. So I want to thank the retirees. I do get a lot of calls from them. And um, being that they're paying about $1,400 a month for that service, um, they'd like to see anything happen that we could bring that cost down for them as then it would trickle down to the city as well. And that's one of my questions is, is that who's doing the negotiations with PHN and Saint and um, uh, Aurora for our rates? Is Prairie States negotiating that for us or are you, who's doing that? No, we actually belong with a consortium called Search. And it's about 43 companies in the city of Sheboygan and Search and Tom Balot from Walworth is a, like the chairman of it. And then they, they, they have a committee that sits down with both Aurora and, and PHN St. Nick's and negotiates rates with, with the two groups. Good. And then my other question is, is that are we currently covering experimental drugs or experimental procedures? I, I, I don't know that, that category to have to look at. Because if we are, that's going to have a big uh, impact and that's something we need to make sure that are in the contracts in the future is that we don't pay for things that are not approved by the FDA. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't. I, our plan is pretty standard. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know of any exceptions that we would grant that any other plan would at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Alderman Recchi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Surik, when it comes to the insurance we offer our employees, is it just one standard plan for everybody, or are there different levels that the employee can pick from depending upon what level of service they think they might need? Uh, we have one, right now we have one plan, and that's why we're looking at the HSAs, which would be a higher deductible. Uh, the only problem that you run into uh, is an item where you have, okay, well, I have lesser coverage, and we have adverse selection where you have the employees and the families or large groups of families that, that really use the plan. They'll take the better part of the plan and, and pay their premium. Or the people that, you know, don't use the plan, that, you know, don't have any prescriptions, don't see the doctor every couple of years, they'll take the cheaper plan. And that's... That's where you run it. It's, it's real. You're really walking a tightrope when you're trying to say, is this going to save us money or it's going to cost us money? The same thing with the HSAs that, you know, where we would say, okay, here's $2,700 and we're going to make your deductible $2,700. How do we know we're just trading dollars? Are we really going to save money? Now, we've been toying around with this thing for a couple of years now because I, I won't, don't want to recommend a plan that's going to look real good on paper and then end up costing us more money. So uh, I'm not totally convinced that that offering an HSA without some real control over it's going to save the city any money. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Serta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. During our last negotiation process, was there a union that was willing to contribute more than the 2.5%? And if, we're, I guess for us to deny if, if they want to contribute more, was there a different offset just so we could understand okay. why we wouldn't take that offer? Yeah, I know. I've heard that before. And unfortunately, they didn't tell you the other part of the, the story, you know. <laughs> you know, we're willing to give you 5%. Well, you want this, we want that. When it was a, and it was a package deal. Now, we'd be a fool, and I'd be a fool negotiating a contract to ignore someone willing to contribute more uh, without having it cost more. But uh, if you look at the whole, whole plan, and how we had initially had in there, uh, I think we had initially 2 and a half, going to a 5, 7 and a half, and a 10. And they, they basically said, no, we won't even look at that. And then they came back, uh, I think maybe the police association was perhaps, I don't want to go into groups, but anyway, when you look at the whole picture, it said that was not a good deal for the city. So, and then, but I heard somebody say, well, we were willing to give, but the city wouldn't do it. Well, you gotta look at the whole picture. You know. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Hearing none, then uh, we have a motion on the floor to To accept and adopt the RC. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Sure votes aye. Any opposed? Motion passes.
Next on the agenda is discussion regarding the Mean Public Library and maintenance of effort and how it will affect the City of Sheboygan's participation in the Eastern Shores Library System and the EasyCast system. Sharon, if you could, uh, thank you for waiting. And if you could uh, come to the podium and give us, give us your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You do have an outline of the presentation in front of you. It was distributed earlier. And there are some handouts attached to that outline. Just by way of a little bit of background information, um, there are 17 library service systems in the state of Wisconsin, and they are established to help libraries cooperate to offer services less expensively uh, than might be the case if each individual library was uh, providing those services or uh, responsible for those operations. And uh, in large part, the system services are funded by state aids. So for example, Sheboygan residents currently get the benefit of state-funded services through Sheboygan's membership in Eastern Shores Library System, which is the next item on the outline. I would like to say that David Weinhold, who is the director of Eastern Shores Library System, is here this evening, and um, if I can finish my presentation in time, he'll be available in case there are any questions. He does have another commitment that will call him away shortly. Um, Eastern Shores Library System is the library service system that serves Sheboygan and Ozaki counties. And there are participation requirements for the city's membership in Eastern Shores Library System. And the one we're talking about tonight is called the Maintenance of Effort Funding Requirement. And I do have an excerpt from state statutes. A municipal public library may participate in a public library system if it receives funding from the municipal governing body at a level that is not lower than the average of such funding received for the previous three years. So it's a fairly simple uh, arithmetic calculation. Um, it's complicated because there have been um, some statute changes and um, some attorney general opinions related to what counts toward maintenance of effort. So just to be very clear about that, it is the funding from the Common Council that is considered to be qualified toward maintenance of effort. It's not any capital support, it's not any gift, uh, it's not any carryover funds. The Common Council has authorized uh, Mead Library to participate in Eastern Shores Library System, and that is a function of the Common Council. That is a decision that the Common Council made in the past, that it, the library, its library, should participate in the library service system in the area, which is Eastern Shores Library System. The maintenance of effort requirement for 2007 uh, is listed in the outline. It's $2,627,455, or 19120 dollars more than the funding for 2006. And I'd like to stress that, um, again, it's the average funding for the last three years Funding the library at maintenance of effort level does not mean that you're funding the status quo, so to speak, that you're funding the current level of services and allowing those to continue going forward. Because again, it's simply an average of the last three years, and as addressed in the earlier presentation, naturally there are costs that increase from year to year. I'd also like to point out that um, if the library department were to be funded at the maintenance of effort, it would still need to make budgetary adjustments in order to meet the financial constraints that all of the departments will be facing. So it's not as though saying funding at maintenance of effort holds the library harmless in some way or means that the library isn't going to have to make budgetary adjustments, uh, reduce staffing, uh, reduce services, etc., cetera, um, as the other departments are facing for 2007. I had the opportunity to attend the Common Council Finance Committee meeting just prior to this one, and my understanding is that that Finance Committee has adopted a resolution uh, that calls for the library department to be funded in 2007 at the 2006 level. So um, that means that um, if things continue forward, 
um, along the line of that resolution that the Common Council funding will not meet the maintenance of effort funding requirement for 2007. Um, there are, as I understand it, no degrees of making or not making the maintenance of effort funding requirement. You either fund at or above maintenance of effort level or you don't. Um, there's four bullet points on the uh, back side of the outline that you have. The maintenance of effort funding requirement is required for Sheboygan's continued participation in Eastern Shores Library System. ESLS provides state-funded services to Mead Public Library. The state-funded services are essential to library services for residents of the city. And local funding would need to replace the state-funded services that would likely be lost if the library doesn't participate in Eastern Shores Library System or if it's penalized because it's no longer a member in good standing. So there's some alternatives that we're listing here going back to the outline. Um, a library, a community that doesn't meet maintenance of effort can be expelled by ESLS. And I understand from talking a little bit more with David Weinhold and from um, information um, provided by representatives of the Division for Libraries, Technology, and Community Learning that that is a last resort. Uh, it's not something that's going to happen um, on November 27th or November 28th, the day after you would adopt your uh, funding level for Mead Public Library for 2007. Uh, but it is something that's taken quite seriously and that would cause system representatives and state representatives to treat with the Common Council to um, see if there's any way that the Common Council is able to meet maintenance of effort funding. Um, Naturally, if that's not going to come to be and a certain amount of time passes, then the law, the statutes do speak to ex expulsion from the system. There's also the opportunity for the Common Council to withdraw from Eastern Shores Library System. That's addressed in the statutes because once again, whether or not your library is going to be participating in the library service system is a policy decision as well as a funding decision of the Common Council. Um, Looking at that alternative, uh, the earliest time uh, by which this council could withdraw from participation in Eastern Shores Library System would be effective for your fiscal year 2008 due to contractual obligations to give at least six months notice prior to the end of the system's fiscal year, which is a calendar year. While this uh, talking back and forth about coming into compliance is going on, it is possible that the um, system, as determined by uh, the system board and um, also reviewed by the Division for Libraries, Technology, and Community Learning, could invoke penalties. And my understanding is that the penalties are withholding service from Mead Public Library. Um, now, the thing is, that the services are essential to the operation of the library for the most part. And I'll go over those a little bit further down the list. Um, at one point, we were looking at perhaps missing the maintenance of effort by 152,000 and looking at the effect that would have on the maintenance of effort for 2008. So that's what that note is there. Um, now we're looking at missing it by about $19,120. Um, thanks to some creative um, efforts by Rich Gebhardt to um, make funds available for the debt service. There's also what I'm understanding, what I'm calling de facto expulsion, because to expel a municipality from Eastern Shores Library System brings about a reduction in the resources available to that system to continue serving the remaining libraries. And I understand that there's been some recent conversation at the state level about um, penalizing a library that doesn't um, meet the membership requirements by withdrawing or withholding all of the services from that library, but not officially expelling that library. So that's another alternative that's listed here. And it's, this is kind of complicated because a lot of these decisions, of course, are made by bodies other than yourself. 
uh, made by Eastern Shores Library System, reviewed by the Division for Libraries, Technology, and Community Learning. And we frankly don't know uh, what some of these entities may do. Although the library, in order to continue serving the public, needs to budget uh, to replace the services that could be lost if maintenance of effort funding is not achieved for Sheboygan. So there's another special category that's the next thing on your outline, and that's participation in the Shared Integrated Library System, or ILS, that you may know as EasyCAT. It's called EasyCAT in this area. It's a big shared system, a big shared customer database, collection database with requests and materials moving around the two county area. There is a contract that governs participation in that service of Eastern Shores Library System. And that contract says that members of the system must be in good standing in order to participate. So that's a different animal than any kind of statutory penalty that might come up because there's a contractual obligation that Sheboygan would not be meeting if the council does not fund the library department at the maintenance of effort level. We've been um, talking with uh, the vendor of uh, the software for that system. It's an international vendor. And the latest figures show that the cost of replacing that ILS through purchase would be a little over $300,000. Um, one thing we've also talked about, since we're needing to look at different budget scenarios, is participating in EasyCAD as a non-member of Eastern Shores Library System. Now, that would mean that the city would need to withdraw, the Common Council would need to withdraw from Eastern Shores Library System, making Mead a non-member, or the system could expel Sheboygan, and then Mead Library would be a non-member public library. This is an idea that the Shared Library Automation Committee, made up of representatives from um, all of the libraries in the two-county area, has proposed and that will be presented to the Eastern Shores Library System Board for its decision about whether or not that could happen. So again, that decision is not anything that we can make. That's something the Eastern Shores Library System Board has to decide. But um, again, as a non-member, we would need to pay for services provided by Eastern Shores with local funds rather than having Sheboygan residents get the benefit of the existing state-funded services. We also lose revenue if we're no longer in good standing no longer a member of Eastern Shores Library System. Mead Library serves as a resource library for Eastern Shores Library System, and there's an annual income of around $43,000 for that. So um, that would be in jeopardy. The major services that I mentioned that are necessary to operate the library that are provided cooperatively at this point in time by Eastern Shores Library System are cataloging, delivery, among the various libraries participating in the system, internet service, and interlibrary loan. All of those things would need to be replaced in some way using local dollars if the maintenance of effort is not met and if um, negotiations don't result in its being met. You've got in your handout a double-sided sheet that presents the cost of library system services and the value of those services. And this was prepared by Eastern Shores Library System. It shows the cost for Sheboygan of various services, the major ones that I mentioned, the interlibrary loan, delivery, internet services, and cataloging services. And then it shows the value on the verso of that page. And the value is shown for delivery and cataloging on the basis of Mead Library not getting the services from the system and needing to go out into the marketplace and purchase them elsewhere. And you can see that there would be some significant costs uh, based on the assumptions that Eastern Shores Library System staff members made when they created this value sheet. So our problem, if you want to call it that, our challenge in um, looking at budgeting uh, for 2007 is what is going to be the cost of replacing 
the Eastern Shores Library System services that are necessary for the operation of the library that are going to be jeopardized by the Common Council's not being able to meet the maintenance of effort funding for 2007. And I would just sum up again that, you know, some important points for consideration um, I suggest are that Sheboygan residents will lose the benefit of state-funded services, will lose the benefit of the ability of Eastern Shores to cooperatively provide services for a much lower cost than a library would realize by going out into the marketplace to purchase them. And there's also the big, uh, gigantic number out there, in my opinion, for replacing the integrated library system um, purchase again at over $300,000. David Weinold is here. He does need to leave uh, shortly. And I wonder if anyone might have questions for him at this time that he could address. I got lights everywhere. Um, I'm going to start with Vice President Serta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to indeed ask the finance, specifically Chairman Groff, um, if indeed this reg resolution is going to have a shortfall of 19,000, because given the information that was just um, given to us, it looks like we would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars just to supplement the same service, just for us, you know, that shortfall of 19,000. We the um, the resolution is coming to uh, council. It is uh, with the $19,000 shorting of the library. That is correct. And does, does the finance, are, have you explored the idea of some type of arbitration with the Eastern Shores? How well, are you going to address <clears throat> these issues? No one from finance has talked with Eastern Shores. Uh, the only one who has talked with Eastern Shores, I believe, is, is um, <clears throat> Mrs. <clears throat> Excuse me, is Sharon. But um, that doesn't say that we won't in the future. But right now, we're making this recommendation just to, to let everybody know the extent of the, what finance is recommending is that we go with what we did in 2006. And so everybody knows, all the departments know that we're, 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 what we're looking at right now. At least finance is making that recommendation to council. Council can change that if they so choose. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that um, we're talking 19,000 here, and there are other things that um, was, Sharon mentioned something about uh, that Rich did some creative financing and so forth to cover some other things. And I think there's some other creative financing things that he could do to possibly cover this. But my question uh, that, that I have also is, is regarding what Eastern Shores may or may not do, because we don't know for sure if they are going to um, hit us with any penalties or not. And, that's why I have my light on to ask, um, I ask a question at a later date. So, so would you, you would like him to address? That would be a good, uh, would ultimately, address? yes. But um, I have a question. Uh, but if uh, Vice President Sir is a good not, time. He's, he's got to get going. So. OK. My, my question, then, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, would be, is there such a thing? I know um, Sharon had, had mentioned that she feels that we will get sanctioned, we might be expelled, we might do this. No decision has been made on what may happen if we do not fund the maintenance of effort with, with um, Mead Public Library right now. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, we can't make a decision until there's actually a, a, a non-complying act. Okay. So until you make a decision about funding, we can't do anything at all. We can just is, tell you what the possibilities are. OK, is it also possible that there wouldn't be, if, if say the city of Sheboygan would say, okay, we have to do things this way this year, and it looks like we're not going to make the maintenance of effort, but it's only going to be a one year period, would that be taken into consideration and could there be no penalty or something? Because Mead Public Library is a huge part of the Eastern Shores Library System, is that correct? Again, um, Certainly, our efforts will be to try to bring you back in compliance. So if that's the case and we sit down and discuss with the city and we learn what the conditions are, those conditions can be taken into consideration. There has been some examples in other parts in other cities in the state. So this is not unusual that 
cities don't meet that cities have a problem meeting the maintenance of effort requirement is um, the system sits down with the city and talks about why and and gives all the reasons and then comes to some conclusion so maybe is okay. the best I can answer <laughs> one final question if I may sure is um, are there any other cities within the Eastern Shore library system that presently are in the same situation Sheboygan is uh, you're the first city that's talking about their budget uh, this early. Um, none of the other cities that I'm aware of in Eastern Shores or any of the villages um, have begun any of these discussions yet. So we're not aware of any problems okay. yet. Thank you. So. Thank you. Alderman Clahunas. Uh, Alderman Groff answered, asked each of my questions. So. <laughs> you beat you to the punch. One. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to give you some insight of what we're looking at this year, we just came from a finance meeting and Public Works, the Fire Department, and the Police Department this year are all going to be hit roughly four to $500,000. We're talking about not being able to find $19,000 to fund the library, and we're going to have department heads screaming at us that they don't want to be cut four to $500,000 each. Currently, the taxpayers of Sheboygan, um, just the city residents, are paying about $7,000 a day to keep the library running. When you add in the other sources of revenue from the county, you're running the library at about $9,000 a day, 365 days a year. That's what we're giving to them, which is a boatload of money. One year, we're a little bit tight on money, and we are not going to probably be able to come up with this extra $19,000. If we have an extra $19,000 in the budget, I'd rather see it go to the police department rather than cutting them $500,000. Um, the library is an important part to the Eastern Shores. This would be a one-year temporary situation, and I think we will be able to level off the uh, maintenance of effort after this year. And I would ask that you take into consideration perhaps a one-year probationary period for the city of Sheboygan because it would probably be a one-year uh, situation. So I would ask that you just keep that in mind because we have much bigger shortfalls with our other departments than just with the library. It, um, it's not really a question, but I guess I just want to make the comment, and as was pointed out earlier, is... Um, the library system uses state funds, which are paid for by the city of Sheboygan through your state income taxes and sales taxes to provide cooperative services. I think um, certainly those state funds are for the benefit of everybody. And I guess we would hate to see the opportunity for you to lose the ability to take advantage of those state funds where we can save considerable amounts of money for the library we have over the past uh, uh, 20 or more years that the library has been in the library system to achieve certain certain um, economies of scale that the city has taken advantage of because the library has had to make those make those purchases. So uh, certainly, I hope you keep that in mind too as you discuss um, whether that that $19,000 is a worthwhile investment. Thank you. Um, I'll get Alderman Ryan, then I'll get Vice President Burke. Well, so, sir, what you're saying is that the the uh, Eastern Shores Library System, if the city of Sheboygan does not come up with the extra $19,000, would be willing, you would be willing to forego the Mead Public Library participating in your program um, over a $19,000 one-year shortfall? Well, I don't know if it's a one-year shortfall. How is the we're all speculating at this time. You haven't passed a budget. Um, you know, we're, we're waiting, we're assuming that there's going to be a non-complying act. I'm not assuming that there's going to be a non-complying act. How is, how is the maintenance of effort formula, is that a constant number or does that increase annually with inflation, et cetera, et cetera? It changes based upon what you appropriate to, this, to the library. Um, so let's, let's use... You appropriate $100,000 one year, $150,000 the next year, and $150,000 the following year. It's the average of those three numbers. So it depends upon your appropriation. All we're saying is that at the end of three years, you have to meet that average in order to maintain your membership. And that is not adjusted, adjusted for inflation? No, or it's adjusted based sort. upon your decisions. Thank you. Thank you, President Berg. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Presumptive that uh, Mead Public Library essentially is the big dog in the system. It's the largest library in the system, and right? And the one that 
then suffers most, I think the term is negative borrowing, where we tend to distribute more resources than we receive from others? Correct. And uh, that being said then, uh, does, are each of the library systems, like Eastern Shores, are they autonomous? So for example, we're need to withdraw, I'm assuming it's a two-way street, that the library would not get, if you would, the resources from Eastern Shores, but on the other hand, the library wouldn't be bound to lend uh, material to any of the Eastern Shores libraries. Is, is that reasonable? Um, if they're no longer a member of the system, then the library is responsible for um, serving its own um, residents. It doesn't have any responsibility for serving other, other residents. However, um, the statutes do allow it to participate in the county library service, so if they want to receive those county funds, then they do have to uh, share their resources with uh, uh, what we call the non-library residents of Sheboygan and County. Then as a follow-up question, would as, I don't know how parochial the library systems are, would Eastern Shores then have the ability to find a resource library, say, through Milwaukee County? Or the statutes how? allow us to look for alternatives to resource libraries if, if the largest library in the system does not wish to be the resource library. Um, Media Library could decide that already if they wanted to, but um, so far has chosen to maintain that role because they do have a contract with mm -hmm. us and receive $43,000 uh, of state funds to serve in that role. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Racky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is, how many uh, libraries make up the Eastern Shores system with, of course, me being the basically the anchor library, how many smaller libraries are there in the system? There's uh, 12 other libraries in the system. Um, there are five in Sheboygan County, five in Ozaki County, and eight in Sheboygan, and seven others in Sheboygan County um, that make up the Eastern Shores library system. And with those libraries making up the Eastern Shores system, and us being the resource library, we're sending out more than we're bringing in. Does that, are our costs covered in doing that first off, and second off, with us being the big dog in the system, and we have what, Nequan and, and uh, Grafton and things like that in there, how do those libraries benefit the city of Sheboygan taxpayers that fund the Mead Public Library for everyday operations, yet the resources that we need are sitting on, down in, in southern Ozaki County? How does that benefit the, pet, the taxpayers in the city of Sheboygan? Do you want to answer? <laughs> I think it's a shared question. There is a system of shared resources in place through the EasyCAT integrated library system that I mentioned is a shared database. It's a shared collection of all of the libraries that participate in Eastern Shores library system, including Lakeland College added on top of that. So there is a delivery system and you could get next day or second day delivery depending at the time you make a request in the automated system. So, um, yes, um, residents outside of Sheboygan do call upon the Mead Public Library collection, and yes, um, Mead Public Library is a net lender now, but the other thing to keep in mind is that Sheboygan residents do have access reciprocally to these collections and other libraries. So that's how Sheboygan residents benefit, in addition to the state-funded services that are lower costs and going out into the marketplace. So let me follow up, how many times a year do we actually pull resources in from the other libraries or since we're mostly putting out to the other libraries, how many, how many times a year do we pull in? I mean, what does it benefit me to be in the Eastern Shore system if I'm going down to the Mead Public Libraries, a taxpayer in Sheboygan, paying the bills in this library to get a book and it's out for the next 60 or 90 days in Southern Ozaki County because it's on an interlibrary loan. How does that benefit the people here? when they need that resource and it's not here? Well, it's not going to be out for 60 or 90 days, most likely, due to loan periods that control that. Um, also, we pull in materials every day from the other member libraries. There's probably not a day that the library operates that there aren't things delivered from all of the other participating libraries to Mead Public Library for Sheboygan residents to use. It's just that being a large concentration of population and being, as you said, the largest library, the largest collection, that Mead is a net lending library. One could look at the 
value of the library services provided by Eastern Shores and consider that that is a fair trade. Now that's something that needs much more in-depth analysis. Um, look at the cost of replacing the integrated library system. You know, that we did ascertain last year that that is um, an optional service provided by Eastern Shores Library System. Mead Public Library would not have to participate in that particular system. And that system is pretty much what drives the net lending position that you're talking about. But is the library, is the city in a position to pay to replace that? And also to realize then that Sheboygan residents won't have the advantage of calling upon this much larger collection of resources if we go it alone. So, you know, that's a policy decision. That particular decision would most likely be made by the library board with a lot of in-depth discussion with the common council probably sitting as the committee of the whole. That's a really kind of a separate question from whether or not Mead Library is going to be a member of Eastern Shores Library System and continue to receive the shared services that are funded by the state. Because as I mentioned earlier, there's a contract in place. And I don't know if that would be negotiable or not. That contract was agreed upon by each and every participating library that participates in EasyCat. And again, that contract states that each library must be a member in good standing of Eastern Shores. So I understand your interest in negotiation. I understand that you're going to evidently miss maintenance of effort by 20,000 rather than a larger amount that we had anticipated earlier. Um, but I don't know that that contract is negotiable. So realize that um, that's hanging out there. That's by contract, not by, um, not governed by statute related to um, the negotiations, the penalties, et cetera. Thank you, Alderman Susha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, earlier this evening, the finance department, or the finance committee accepted a, a donation for $1,100 to buy a bulletproof vest for the canine unit. So the dog now is protected. And I'm wondering if there's any problem if a private citizen or a service club wanted to contribute $19,120 to the library to make up this shortfall, would there be any conflict with that? We gladly accept all donations, and we have had some wonderful contributions to the library through the years. However, contributions are not considered as part of the maintenance of effort. Okay. The Common Council needs to provide the funding through city funds. Just as a follow-up question, if I may, um, however, if they made the donation to the city and earmarked it for that particular cause, I believe then it would be able to be applied, would it not? I don't know that it could be earmarked by the donor. I suppose that if the city were to receive some funds and the donor said, do with these monies what you will, and for some reason the Common Council decided that it wanted to use those monies to meet the maintenance of effort funding requirement, that that having been general money available to the city, money generally available to the city, however we want to phrase it, I don't know that that would be a concern, but what does David Weinhold think? <laughs> I, don't know. I, I think you'd have to ask the city attorney to interpret that part of it because there are, in the statutes, there are uh, definitions about what can and can't be used to meet maintenance of effort. So I think you'd have to get that type of advice for that thing. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Groff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up on um, Alderman Ryan's um, question regarding uh, the maintenance of effort and so forth. And Sharon, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we were always contributing the maintenance of effort and always kind of meeting that until about two years ago when there was some additional funding that was available and the library received more than the maintenance of effort, which kind of put us in this um, situation where we are now because I, I thought the, instead of contributing the maintenance of effort, I thought like two years ago we contributed like I want to say $100,000 or, or $75,000 or something which was considerably more than the maintenance of effort. 
let's remember that the maintenance of effort is not a recommended level of funding for Correct, your public library. It's simply the average of the last three years. Correct. Historically, the maintenance of effort never really played into the equation when Common Council was determining the appropriate funding for the library department because the library was funded well above that. And then I would say, just recall it, since I don't have that in front of me, maybe it was perhaps about 10 years ago or so that the council reduced the library budget below the maintenance of effort level and then needed to bring it back up. And ever since then, the council has seemed to want to fund the library pretty much around the maintenance of effort, which again is the average of the last three years. And as you know, as costs increase, um, that's probably not going to be allowing any development or growth in the library. But then I understand we're not in a growth phase here in the city with any sort of funding for operations. But, but so it's not, it's not something that you did to yourselves by funding the library um, <coughs> above the maintenance of effort level, well, except that it is the, it is the mean. It is the mean of the funding for the last three years. Okay, but I, I think it was back in 2004 when we were looking at the budget for 2005. There was a debate on the floor, and um, the question was, <coughs> should we give all this funding to, um, to, the, um, to the library? And I believe I made the motion to cut it in half. Yes, you did. Okay, and then Alderman, I think it was Alderman Warner, made a motion to increase it by a certain amount which was more than the regular maintenance of effort. And I think that's why you're looking at the last three years, you're going to have more in that one year that we have to make up now. And I think you actually, <coughs> you actually moved to um, eliminate that, and then Alderman Warner moved to uh, decrease it by only half. I think that's actually how it It could have been that out. way, but yeah. I know that was one of the things that was done that particular year that now is included in those three years. So our maintenance of effort was, was, was we gave more than the maintenance of effort that particular year. And now the last couple of years we've been shooting for this maintenance of effort. So One would that, think that your maintenance <clears throat> of effort would increase every year if you are able to fund your library What we're required to give is a maintenance expenses. of effort I'm talking about. Yes, one would think that your maintenance of effort requirement would increase every year because the costs of operating departments increase every year. But if you're not in that situation and you're funding around the maintenance of effort, you will get fluctuations. You will get it going up and then you will get it going down a little bit. And then because of the funding that's included in the mean for the immediately preceding three years, it'll tick up again a little bit. And that's kind of the... That's where we are now. It's in this little tick up year here. A little bit too much. Though. Of 20,000. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you very Thank you. much, Thank Mr. Weinhold. Thank you. Alderman Clarunas. Yes. Um, Sharon, uh, well, first of all, answering Jeff, um, I have a book in my house from Mequon Library right now. Um, I get books from the lot. You know, I'm constantly looking for books, and, and it's nice to know that if Sheboygan doesn't have it, you can get it in two days, usually, if somebody else has it. And they had the, the EasyCAD system shows you exactly where they are, when they're due. It's an amazing system, and it's an amazing resource for us to get things from all over the eastern shores. Uh, so it, it works wonderfully. It's a great example of shared services. Yes, it is. Um, the, I, I other thing, my other thing is here, I'm looking at, uh, and I know this is hard to get, to get, but county money, I mean, you've got city, uh, cities in the county Cedar Grove, Elkhart Lake, Kohler, Oostburg, Plymouth, Random Lake, Sheboygan, Sheboygan Falls. Those are all in the county, and they're all within the system. Yes. But we also have townships mm -hmm. who aren't paying anything. Yes, they are. They are. And that, they can't help us with this? That's what Mr. Weinhold referred to earlier when he was talking about who would Mead Public Library serve if it were not part of Eastern Shores Library System. So we'd have to pay this. So the people who would have no library service if they didn't use established libraries, like people in town Wilson, town Sheboygan, yeah. et cetera, do pay the county library levy. Okay, they do. And people who live in areas that support libraries are exempt from the county library levy. 
because their municipalities, et cetera, can't exempt, and we do exempt here in Sheboygan. So those people out in the towns do pay, and the income from Sheboygan County is um, between five hundred and six hundred thousand dollars this year. Okay. Uh, from those people in the towns, and it is based on usage. That's all tracked uh, in the integrated library system, and okay. there is a cost formula for each library, and that gets calculated, and that's the payment then. There's a Sheboygan County Library Planning Committee that met a couple years ago. Alderman Manny was on the library board at that time, and he represented Sheboygan. And the report from that committee that was adopted by the Sheboygan County Board um, is going to move the funding up until uh, the county is paying about 90% of the actual cost per this calculation I just described. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Alderman Brahassel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sharon, could you explain the um, non-member option with EasyCat that you mentioned in your report here? Can I assume it's a streamlined version, or is it, would it be an identical version if they approved it? If? Okay, first of all, we'd have to be a non-member. If we withdrew or were expelled. If we withdrew or were expelled. The other library representatives at a meeting of the Shared Library Automation Committee that controls the operation of EasyCat proposed that perhaps a non-member public library could buy in to use EasyCat. And the figure that was talked about at that time was that 99000 so that's an estimate. And it was derived from the cost of providing the services, on your, you can look at that on your cost sheet, that are related to using EasyCat, um, using the delivery, using the cataloging. There's some shared automation costs that are in there, and you'll probably come up to about 99000 And then we would have to pay existing fees that are um, currently owed now. On top of that, we do pay relatively small fees in the range of $10,000, if I'm recalling correctly, annually. But we'd have to be out of the system first in order to be considered a non-member, of course. And that would have to be approved by Eastern Shores Library System. But it'd be your understanding that it'd be a similar level of service? Yes. Okay, it'd be a similar, and the 99000 is a annual fee? Yes, annually. Okay. Remember that you're paying that from local funds, and prior to that time, it was paid through state funds derived from the state taxes that Sheboygan residents and everyone throughout the state pay. So that's going to be the trade-off. You'd be paying around $100,000 with local money that you weren't paying before, that was being paid, yes, by taxpayers, but in their state taxes, and that, frankly, Sheboygan residents aren't going to get a refund for if Sheboygan is not in Eastern Shores Library System. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, from the looks of this, I believe it is uh, essential that Sheboygan stay in the uh, Eastern Shores Library System as far as uh, it makes ec good economic sense for the city. Um, However, I do not see the Eastern Shores Library System uh, expelling the city of Sheboygan or Mead Public Library uh, from, the, from participating for uh, merely a $19,000 shortfall. Um, it's especially, uh, as Mr. Graff had noted, that uh, there was a, a major uh, increase a couple of years back that is uh, factoring into our, our, our formula right now. Uh, I think uh, the Eastern Shore Li Shores Library System, I think, should understand that uh, right now the city is in a, a, a serious uh, uh, budgetary uh, uh, crunch right now. And uh, there simply is not the money, in, and, and I don't believe that the, it's proper to fund the library uh, to, to, to give more funding to the library when other departments are being cut back. Uh, I, I, I believe, uh, it's my own personal belief, that uh, um, we should take our chances on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Graff? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, looking at um, what Alderman um, Rohassel had, had said, 
uh, regarding the $99,000 for um, the, the current share of that, that contract. Okay, if we were no longer a member of Eastern Shores, we wouldn't be required to have any maintenance of effort, and mm -hmm. therefore we would take the 99,000, or say the library needs to take that 99,000 out of the 2,627,000 that we would be giving you. You could very well do that. Okay. Okay. If you no longer have the maintenance of effort that you seem to have been using as a guide for funding the library department, um, then you'll need to develop some other means of determining what level is appropriate. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. With that, uh, we can go to item number eight, which would be adjournment. <laughs> second. Motion is second to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair will say aye. We are adjourned. It's, it's well, amend, it's amendable. It is amendable. It's amendable. The referral is but amendable. there was no second. Is there a second? <laughs> There's a motion and a second to refer to the committee of the whole instead. That will take precedence. That is debatable. That requires a majority vote. Is anybody, does anybody want to say something? Excuse me. Excuse me. Let me, let me, let me hook you on. Okay, I'll remember. A point of order, I don't have my Roberts Rules of Order, but if I recall, when an amendment substantially changes the intent of the original amendment, uh, then uh, that has to, then uh, that isn't a valid amendment. It's a hostile is, amendment in this case. It's a hostile case. amendment? Is, is that, and if that's the case, uh, would, would this be considered a hostile amendment? It does not change the, it, all it does refer to another committee with all the alderman present. So I don't see it would change the substance of, of, the, okay, uh, thank you. of the amendment itself. So that's thank why you. I allowed it. But it, it does refer to as a hostile amendment mm -hmm. because it's contrary to the original intent of the first mm -hmm. one. So we're back. Does anybody want to discuss the, um, the referral to committee of the whole? Oh, excuse me, alderman Manning. Alderman Kittleson, did you want to say something on that? I was just going to support that we send it to salary and grievance, and then we get the opportunity to attend that meeting. The library board gets to be there, and we can discuss it there at that committee. Thank you. Alderman Vanderweel on the amendment to the committee of the whole. Sir? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, if anybody listened to the radio or read the paper, they all know that we're going to discuss this tonight. So I would ask is if there is any other members besides Susan Hunley of the board here tonight because they could have come and spoken to us tonight if we would have asked. That's a good point. Thank you. Okay, we have Alderman Manny, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Dialogue's a good thing. Opportunity for conversation with other board members present, I think that would be advantageous. I see nothing to be lost in that. So wherever, wherever place it goes, I would like the referral. Okay. We will call the roll on the motion. This would be on the motion to refer to, or it's an amendment to send to a committee of the whole instead of salary and grievances. So an I vote would be to send it to the committee of the whole. Uh, let's see here. Sigali. Aye. Stefan? Aye. Susha? No. Van Akron? No. Vanderweel? No. Bauman? No. Deberg? Aye. Eberg? No. Serta? Graf? No. 
Hiddleston? Aye. Manny? Aye. Meyer? No. Montemayor? No. Radke? Aye. Seven ayes and eight noes. Motion fails. We'll take a vote on the other amendment to refer to salary and grievance. Mm -hmm. Stefan? Aye. Susha? No. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? No. Bauman? Aye. Deberg? Aye. Eberg? No. Serta? Aye. Graf? No. Kittleson? Aye. Manny? Aye. Meyer? No. Montemayor? No. Radke? No. And Sigali? No. Seven ayes, eight noes. Motion fails. Go back to the original motion. Okay, hold on. <laughs> The uh, original motion, I believe, was a... Uh, the original motion was to pass... I'm sorry, <coughs> worse, we still have on the floor the, the amendment to ask for the resignation of all 10. No, that failed. Oh, we failed. That failed. Back to the original motion to pass the resolution to ask mm -hmm. for the... Six. Immediate we're back. six. Great, right, we're back. Back to the original. Alderman Eberg, you look like you're... <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, thank you, and I... It's symbolic of the vacillation I think many of us have feel tonight to pull the trigger or, or not pull the trigger. And I think uh, in, in that regard, what we're having is a symbolic discussion about that I think is reflective of the feelings and frustrations with uh, one unique decision that was made uh, and one vote. And I, I, uh, a part of me that looks at my life in some ways, I'm hired to be a professional voter. Uh, this week, with the committee meetings, I'll probably cast something like 60 or 70 votes. So there's a part of me that personally is reluctant to ask for someone to resign based upon only their decision on one vote. So I think for me the question is, does this vote really meet that threshold for me to, uh, re to request that someone really quit their job as a result of what they've done on one vote? Uh, conversation is a two-way street. We expect the library board members to come and talk to us. How many here have thought about contacting the library board members? Uh, I can't say I've talked to all of them, but I've talked to about four or five of them. And as you might guess, they seem to be about as mixed as perhaps we are in terms of their steadfastness regarding uh, matters such as this. So um, one of the as a result of that, I guess I came back from town out of town and I heard that there was this resolution to call for the resignations. And I thought, well, that seems to be kind of strident. And then I got older than Radke's uh, resolution and I started reading it and saying, hmm, I can agree with all your whereases. You know, everything you say under the whereases seem to be what we're talking about and there seems to be a general consensus that we've reached regarding those issues. So I think while we agree on the problem, I don't know that we have clarity of agreement on how that problem is resolved or the solution. That's what brought me to uh, spend some time talking with some of the library uh, trustees. Also had the occasion uh, uh, with Mayor Perez to meet with the library director, uh, Ms. Winkle, to, uh, to, I guess, ascertain her read on the situation and perhaps her willingness to uh, revisit uh, some of the issues that were brought up in uh, the agreement that was signed. Uh, yeah. and I guess out of that, what I came to, even though we agree on the problem, we have somewhat different solutions. Uh, I don't think I can support uh, asking for resignations because I think that just increases the divisiveness. But from listening to the discussion, uh, document, is it uh, 1040? 19. Uh, 1940 cannot be acted upon tonight because uh, by the time we finished our meeting on Thursday, it was too late to get anything in. Uh, therefore, in my long-winded way, what I want to do is make an amendment to this resolution. Yet another. Uh, goes like this. Uh, the whereases will remain the same. And on the back, if you can look at 1940, and say, now be it resolved that by this action, the Common Council of the City of Sheboygan respectfully requests that the Mead Library Board of Trustees act to reopen contract negotiations with the library director
to modify said contract and mirror the terms of employment that apply to other appointed city department heads. So what this does is essentially uh, uh, strike uh, that language that speaks to asking for the immediate resignation, and that includes the body. In other words, uh, uh, to strike on the top a resolution asking for the immediate resignation of Mead Public Library board members, and then to substitute under the be it resolved uh, that part that deals with uh, a request that they go back and give consideration to reopening contracts. Second, <laughs> point of order. You know. Yes, that, that, that's a hostile yeah. amendment. It changes the substance. <laughs> that's what you were against earlier. We can't allow that. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Burke. Alderman Graf? That's, that was it. Yeah. Alderman Serra. That was it. That was it. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> Thanks for making me write Alderman, all that. Thank you. Alderman so much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a couple of things. I think that this is a rather somewhat ugly part of the job of an older person is having to make a decision to either fire somebody or to reprimand anybody in any way because some of these people that are listed here are very good people. They just made a major mistake that I don't think we can overlook. We just need to let them know that we, we noticed what happened and they expect them to take some responsibility and change what they did. Um, a couple of things. I know earlier this evening we had talked about having Attorney McLean get an opinion from the League of Municipalities, and I would suspect that if we do that, the library board will probably turn to the Department of Public Instruction and get, have their attorneys draft an opposing view, possibly, even though I know that some of the talks going on with the Department of Public Instruction, even they are shocked that the library board in Sheboygan actually gave this type of a contract to the director. Um, but there is a possibility that they would present an opposing viewpoint, so we'd have two you know, major entities with opposing viewpoints. So earlier today, I had requested from the mayor to take this issue straight to the attorney general's office and get a written opinion from her on where this issue stands, because I know that Attorney McLean appears to believe that the library board can set compensation levels um, for them, um, whereas I guess the opposing view could be that you have to look at the spirit in which that law was written. And I don't think the spirit in the law says, okay, you can pay this person you know, a $500,000 payout. Um, but anyway, I just think it would be better to get it straight from the top person because then nobody would, I don't think you can refute what the Attorney General has to say. So I hope that we follow up with that avenue in regards to what we can and cannot allow them to do. But in regards to... Um,